Good morning folks, welcome back to Tappanoff Farm. I'm planting out some apple trees this morning. I've been planting apple trees for the last couple of days here in the West Field. And a bit like the work we've been doing in Goosewood, planting apples and cherries to make a small orchard close to the house, we've been also editing this design that we implemented a few years ago. You'd think we'd make our mind up, but I think that's very common and I'm much better to make changes in the early days of a design than wait until it's too late. And currently, trees that we've planted here a couple of years ago the root systems are still small enough that we're able to dig them up and move them. But what I'm doing is basically interplanting apples in these rows of trees that we established a couple of years ago. Uh, this one I'm working on today was a row of chestnut and black locust. Yesterday I was working on a row that was predominantly hazel. And a bit like the goat wood edits that we've been making, planting cherries and apples in place of the aspen and the hazel that was there, it's the same concept here. We've just realized really that we would like to get a lot more human food in the fields that are closest to the house and that we've got still plenty of space available to plant some of the timber species or the fodder species that we're planting for firewood production, coppice, or for the goats for making tree hay and, and just allowing them to browse. We've got plenty of room to plant those on our field boundaries and little woodlots around the north field etc. Spending the time to edit these rows of what were predominantly fuel wood species of trees and now replacing them with um, on the whole apples in this field. We're keeping them in straight lines so that we've got access for harvesting. They're relatively close to the house again for ease of, of harvesting and for checking on them and maintenance. We are going to be interplanting um, what we're trying to focus on here is multi-strata agroforestry, multi-layered agroforestry. Rather than just doing straight rows of single species, we want to try and emulate that forest architecture as much as possible. We are going to put in a few different types of trees in this row, um, occupying the upper canopy, canopy and shrub layer for certain. Um, we might put in a herbaceous layer later on. Um, we don't want to complicate things too much because again these plantings are focusing on producing quite a large volume of apples for our small space anyway. So we want to keep things quite simple, certainly not as species uh, varied and, and high populations as some of the forest gardens that we've been planting over the last several years. But yeah, really pleased to be planting apples out in this field. For now I'm just going to get this last tree in. And this last variety of apple that we're planting today is called topaz. Um, and I think this is an Eastern European variety. But all the trees we've been planting, all the apple trees, are very mixed varieties. We've got cookers and eaters, um, we've got cox varieties, uh, we've got very sweet, juicy varieties, all relatively hardy varieties of apple that can tolerate um, the climate that our part of the world gives them. So really happy to have what is a mixed variety apple orchard coming along in this field. We've been using some mycorrhizal fungi mix that we were given by Chaos Fungorum a few years ago. We're still using this very large tub. This is biochar that's been inoculated with many strains of fungi. Um, this is to promote a healthy root growth of the trees. 25 to 40 painstakingly collective native mycorrhizal species this mix will provide suitable mycorrhiza partners for any tree, boosting tree growth and encouraging the rapid development of a diverse, healthy living soil. So every tree we've planted at Tappanoth over the last several years has had some of this um, sprinkled on the roots. Great, fantastic to have this last apple tree in. Apart from one that we're putting in a pot to plant in our garden later on, 
that is all the apples planted for this year. No more fruit trees left in the nursery from all the various tree nursery orders that we made. So that's a good feeling. So make my way up into what we call the hay meadow just below our shepherd's hut. Um, you can see we've, wherever there's a red flag, we've been planting fruit trees. And um, these ones, we've got a mixture of apple and plum. These were all trees that we ordered last year that received some sort of nibbling from either a goat or a goose, or maybe were a little bit damaged when they came from the nursery. And we've been planting these out in this hedgerow so that they can still grow on, but maybe not giving them the best of places in the de dedicated forest gardens or orchards um, because they were quite badly damaged by the goats and we're not sure how they will continue to grow. So we'll put them in here as a mixed hedgerow. We've already got a huge amount of different trees and shrubs in these hedgerows. We've got hybrid willow, um, we've got some wild plums, uh, gooseberry, blackcurrant, comfrey. So they're all going to grow together and make a nice wind protection for this open field which yeah currently over the last few years we've cut hay we've grazed it um, but we are looking to plant this up with fruit trees in the future uh, not this year maybe not next year but soon so when i was planting those apples i of course removed some of the trees that have been growing there for the last few years we're pretty hopeful that they're gonna take root again and grow in this new location um, we might just have to cut them back a bit some of them might not make it but we're willing to take that risk and we've been planting them out as a hedge. We've got a mixture of hazel, poplar, um, crab apple, pretty much everything that was growing down where we've now dedicated an apple orchard has come up here. And this is to be a windbreak for this field. Um, most of the strong winds come from that direction. We've also planted a 30 meter row of hybrid willow. Um, has two foot cuttings taken from our own willow around and about the farm. So this is going to be a very bushy wind buffering hedge quite soon. So I'm just going to bang in these last few trees. We're finding it very hot today. We've had an unusual burst of hot weather over the last few days. It's been beautiful. Um, definitely our favorite type of weather, but we're certainly not used to it. All right, tea break over. Thanks for that, Rosa. Can you help me up in a minute? <laughs> Did you hear that, guys? Can I help her up in a minute? Yeah, of course I can. <laughs> Six weeks to go, folks. Six weeks until we get some more farm life here. When do you want me to help you up? Now. planting those trees in the west field, Rosa has been getting on with this rejig of our watering system. Uh, so we're going to go see how she's doing. But in essence, what we're doing is taking these two IBCs where we've been collecting rainwater and where we've been piping down pond water. And usually this is where we've then pumped up to the polytunnel. But that's all going to change today. So it's getting to that time of year where we're thinking about irrigating the polytunnel again. It's really dry in here. We've got an increasing amount of uh, seed sown that we don't really like watering with a watering can because uh, it's just a bit heavy for the soil um, with the kind of seeds and, and young seedlings. So. Um, we're trying to kind of connect up everything again. It's always a process of trying to remember how it used to be done a year ago. Um, but this year we're actually moving the system, uh, our IBCs and water kind of pump into the polytunnel. Uh, this should mean that it's better, the pump itself is better protected from the weather, the frosts and things like this. Um, <laughs> Good boy. 
But before I can bring the IBCs in, um, I've got to finish emptying them a little bit. So I'm gonna actually turn on the pump over where it's always been, uh, just behind Shirley's house. Basically water the polytunnel until the IBCs are empty. But to do that, it's always a domino effect of lots of different things. We need to um, put the pieces back into these, basically where the sprays of water come out. It comes through this pipe um, and goes down each of these kind of nozzles um, and then uh, goes through here. I think this is a kind of pressure valve here. Um, and then there's a green piece on the bottom that spins around and creates kind of circle of water and they all overlap to cover the whole polytunnel. So all of those green bits fell off in the, the storms that we had. That meant that we've had to kind of collect them from the soil as we've found them. Uh, I'm going to give them a wash, but I'm going to put them all back in now. I'm removing the end ones here because we're trying to not irrigate these last few beds that we're going to be making because we're going to have tomatoes here. And we've also kind of changed around our seeding area as well, so we don't want to get that wet either. That's the IVC in. It was a bit lighter than we thought actually, which is good. We've just got to do a bit of plumbing uh, to change where this pipe goes so that it attaches to the pump that's going to sit on top of the IVC here. But we've also been quite excited thinking about the kind of thermal mass that this big block of water is going to bring to the polytunnel. So we've got a kind of trellis up the side here. To grow that grape on there that we just got. Exactly, yeah. We've now got to do the slight head scratching bit of working out where all the pipes go <laughs> to make this work. But it's just really nice to have this in here now. We did used to do a lot of running back and forth between the back of the house over there and the um, polytunnel when things weren't going right with the IBC or just to turn it on and off. So having it in here works really well. So a lot of you will be familiar with these IBCs, commonly a sight to be seen around the countryside sitting in farmer's yards. For those who don't, this is a container that typically I think has two ingredients in it, one animal feed and two uh, chemicals like glyphosate. So you really do have to be careful with the IBC tank that you're purchasing. You can of course buy them new, but it's very easy to get them second hand from farmers who don't want them anymore. So just inquire what has been in them, whether it's food grade or not. So this is obviously a food grade one. This had kind of molasses um, food concentrate in it for cattle. We've had these for about six years now. So definitely got a lot of good use out of them. IBC takes a thousand liters of water. Over the past six years of running the market garden, we've typically had 2000 liters, so two tanks. But with this reduction now to just growing food for the home, um, we're gonna see if a thousand is enough for our needs. So the next thing is to reconnect the infill. The infill is from our pond, which is at the top of the property. So gravity fed all the way down from the highest point of the property, almost to the lowest. Mm. Um, and then to get the pressure that's needed for these above sprinklers, we need a pump on at that stage. So now we've got to just figure out all this <laughs> pipe work. Yay!
there to see whether the pump was working and it is so that's great we've got some tightening off of some of the joints to do um, just because there's a bit of leaking sort out the hose pipe that comes down and fill the actual IBC so far so good to wait to fill the IBC tank. We've got to sort out the water supply coming down from the pond. But now we're going to move the sheep because tomorrow they're going to be leaving the farm. A few vlogs back, we let you guys know that we've made the decision to sell the sheep. It was always a bit of a suck it and see with the sheep and they really just are not the easiest to put into the routine that we have for the goats and the geese, rotating the animals. And we just feel they will be better off joining a larger flock of sheep with someone else. So our friends, Holly and Angus, they're gonna come and take the sheep tomorrow. Our sheep will be joining their flock of Shetlands and um, should enjoy being with a larger flock as well rather than just three sheep on their own like they are here. It will be sad to say goodbye. I think it's the best decision. It's gonna give us more free time to put into really caring for the other animals, the geese and the goats and the chickens. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a laneway of electric netting all the way from the north field here running down to what we call the calf paddock where the goats are um, and ultimately onto the roadside so that when Holly and Angus turn up tomorrow with their trailer we can get the sheep into the back of the trailer and off they go. So my mum is coming out to help us this evening. Her and Rosa and I will get this laneway up. All right, okay. Yeah. We have a plan. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna kind of work with the fences that we've already got up on the route down and a bit of a half made dead hedge and a bit of a gate that's not actually really properly put on but the <laughs> sheep won't know about that and just clobber it together to bring them down this route here. laneway all put up and ready for tomorrow to get these girls from the north field down to the bottom of the farm and hopefully smoothly into the back of our friend's trailer. All right that's definitely the end of the day now. Beautiful evening. Great to have achieved this already for tomorrow to get the sheep away. Great to finish planting the apples in our future apple orchard and fantastic to get the irrigation system set up for the polytunnel for the season ahead. All right guys, thanks so much for watching. Hope you're all well out there and until next time, we'll see you soon. See ya.